Morning guys, this is Rolf here with Locked Operations again. I'm going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin mining at small scale. So the type of mining that I'm talking about is enough to make you and maybe a few other people money on a regular basis, but not a large uh, mining operation where you have employees and all sorts of other things like that. So there's a bunch of things that, that go into that, but there's disadvantages to being a smaller scale miner and there's advantages compared to the larger miners. The larger miners are the ones that you hear about in the news all the time. You go see the videos of the tours of their mining facilities and they've got 10,000 miners and monster things and employees that live there and super cheap electricity. That's not what we're trying to do. If we try to copy that, we're already going down the path of not doing so well because we don't have the advantages that they have. So some of the advantages that the large miners have that we don't have, let me write those down and then we can talk about them. Okay, so some of the advantages that large miners have that me as someone who has 200, 400, or 1,000 machines does not have, uh, they have investors. So they're gonna have investors that can put in a bunch of money and get them a bunch of equipment up front when they need to. And that helps, because instead of having to bootstrap your operation out of profits, or take your savings or offset other stuff like that, they have um, investors that'll, that'll put money in for them. They've also got very cheap electricity. Once you start in most uh, places going above 200,000 kilowatt hours per month, you start to get into the inexpensive electricity rates. And that's on the order of two to three cents per kilowatt hour. I guess I've read that some places in China, they just get the overflow from the local uh, damn power plant, maybe it's even less expensive than that. That type of rate is hard to get in the, the 200 unit and under uh, realm. So that's tough to match. They've also got scale that where they can hire employees. Once you start getting a differential between your incoming revenue and your uh, costs, you can pay for some, so, some employees. Now these advantages also turn into disadvantages for them. And let me talk about that as well. Okay, so some of the disadvantages that large miners have is they've got investors that expect profits. These investors are talking to them monthly, quarterly, and they want them to, to give them projections. Okay, how much money are we gonna make uh, this month? How much money are we gonna make this year? When am I gonna be able to start to get some of my money back in the form of cash flow for you selling to a larger organization? Okay, those are sometimes difficult con conversations to have. They're not conversations that I wanna have, for sure, and they, they distract people from the actual operations. So, I've, I've been the owner of a company that has 60 employees without outside investors, thank goodness, um, but I've also invested in companies, and, and I know if I put my money into companies, I expect those folks to deliver results, and I expect to be able to get many times my money back over a five to 10 year period. So dealing with investors is, is a weakness. And so once you have to deal with investors, sometimes you have to do things that uh, are on a short-term basis or don't seem to make sense if you're just running an operation for profitability. Employees cost money. So burden cost of an employee, we'll just say, I don't know, 60,000 to $100,000 per year. Well, that's about as much revenue as 100 eight minor S9s come in. So you think, okay, I, if I have uh, 100 amp miner S9s, the revenue from that, those 100 amp miner S9s is just going to pay that one person. And so you have to have a few hundred amp miner S9s to, take, to get the revenue for the salary for a person. Then you have to have an HR department, you have turnover, you have to provide um, 401k, you have, uh, retirement plans, you gotta provide medical, and pretty soon you're going down the path of having lots of costs that have nothing to do with Bitcoin mining. So employees, try to stay away from having employees if at all possible. Rigid operations. Okay, so with the investors, with the employees, then you have to put together a plan. And you say, well, here's what we're gonna be doing for the next year. We're gonna be buying this many miners, we're gonna be deploying them, and what if 
the Bitcoin price goes down? Or what if something new and different and better comes along? It's really hard to adjust your plans right in the middle of things. So these are some disadvantages that large miners have. So let's talk about how as a smaller scale miner, and I'll, I guess, describe more accurately what a smaller scale miner is, in my point of view, can really reap the benefits of staying away from these types of disadvantages. Okay, so to me, a small miner is someone that's running less than about 1,000 servers. 100 servers, 20 servers, 200, 500, less than about 1,000. Stuff that you and maybe a business partner or one of your kids can help take care of. So we're talking maybe you know one to five people that can take care of this stuff, all folks that are owners in it um, and are not employees. Owners are gonna care about this business enough to make sure that everything's running properly all the time. Employees, eh, a lot of time they have other priorities. I've been an employee, I've had employees. I know how a lot of times the actual running the operation at maximal efficiency and maximal profitability sometimes isn't the priority of an employee. Also, small miners, you can mine bitcoins and altcoins. And we'll talk about in another episode what mining altcoins will do for you and how you can then use those to trade on an exchange and get increased profits. But these are major things that you can do as a small miner. You need to make sure that you're, you're taking advantage of them. Bitcoin mining is a great place to start and there's always going to be room for Bitcoin mining. But once you get your feet wet doing that and get some experience, then you need to look at additional ways to bring in money. I was talking with my son as we were driving over here. My son's 14 years old. I get him on a video one of these times. We homeschool, um, and then so he goes to school a couple days a week, and then uh, the other days he helps me with uh, the mining. So we've been building GPU miners to be mining Zcash and Ethereum uh, and other things like that. We've been trying uh, different miners to be mining Dash and Script. Right now we, we tried uh, mining on the Script miner Litecoin, but we're also mining Goulden. So we talked uh, on the way over about some of the different skills that you've got to have as a small miner, above and beyond the obvious ones of understanding a uh, basic understanding of electricity. Well, I'll write those down. First off, you gotta be able to troubleshoot. When something goes wrong, you can't call someone for help. You gotta be able to figure out how to troubleshoot. Troubleshooting is a methodology that can both be learned. You have uh, a given set of problems and you figure out what are the possible uh, problems that can be causing this issue. And then you step through and eliminate those problems until you've identified the problem and then you fix it. That's the basic troubleshooting methodology. You gotta be able to always refine and improve things. If there's a way to get a more efficient power supply in place, if there's a way to get a less expensive and more reliable data switch in place, uh, if you have a problem where you lose your internet connectivity, okay, well, bring in a second internet connection and have your firewall set up so that automatically flips over to it. Do you have the ability to access stuff from home, either on a secure shell command line, or can you VPN and take care of things? Or do you have to drive into the to the uh, place where you're mining to take care of stuff. So always be refining and improving. Talk to other folks, look at YouTube videos, read different things, always be figuring out how to get things better. Research for ideas and answers. You have to have the ability to go out and read. Uh, look at YouTube videos. The, the latest current information on the way people are doing things is not gonna be in a book somewhere. It's not gonna be in a course that you can take at your local community college. It's gonna be people that are on the leading edge that are willing to share information uh, either in the forums. I read through all sorts of different forums on Bitcoin talk all the time. Uh, then there's Slack channels that I'm on. There's different forums for Litecoin, for Dash, for Zcash. There's all sorts, and there's Reddit forums. There's a bunch of things that you have to go out there and figure out what's, what's going on. Uh, and then you have to keep your ear to the ground for what the different uh, coins and opportunities are. If you put everything into the Bitcoin basket, you might win big, but you might lose big too. You don't want to have everything in one basket and then possibly lose it all. You got to be diversified amongst a number of different activities that you're doing to make money. Uh, ability to just try it. Don't be scared. Um, you know, I, I have no idea if 
dash is worth mining or not. So I did the research. I found that there's two different ASIC miners out there. That's the pin idea and the, the Baikal. I ordered a Baikal from China and I'm mining on it and I'm surprised by how low the power usage is and how decent and flexible the Baikal miner is uh, through being able to mine six different things um, and switch from different pools. So I might give nice hash a try also with a flexible device like that. Maybe we're gonna scale up on that, maybe not. And that goes to the next thing. Don't just come up with a plan and execute on that plan blindly. Start small, prototype, figure out what it is that you're doing, figure out if it's gonna work or not, and then expand on it if it works and quickly abandon it if it doesn't. Um, right now, the Litecoin miner that I bought, which is an A4 uh, InnoSilicon, it doesn't look like it's profitable. So I'm not gonna be mining anything with script until there's a more profitable miner that comes out. I think Bitcoin's coming out with their ant miner L3 soon. That should be profitable enough to mine different things with script. I'm not sure. I'm gonna buy one, I'll give it a try, and if it works, I'll scale up. If it doesn't, I'll abandon it. For a while, I was mining Ethereum. Ethereum's gone down in price and the mining uh, pool has gone up, so I swung all my rigs uh, GPU rigs over to mining Zcash. Right now, that's the, the best thing to be mining. I'll be looking at other things to mine. I was looking at Monero, but uh, Monero's a little strange, so I'm, right now I'm mining Zcash. I put that onto my account at Poloniex. I put sell orders at a recent high point for Zcash to convert it to Bitcoin, and then I convert that Bitcoin into something else and hold on to it. So there's lots of different ways that you can make money as a small miner but you gotta have some basic skills. Now let's talk about some, uh, other than the, the business uh, and operational skills, let's talk about some of the technical skills that you're gonna wanna have or you're gonna wanna learn. Okay, so if we're running a mining operation, first of all, we're bringing electric power into the miners. Okay, uh, we're also bringing cooling in to cool the miners. Those miners are going to be getting information from the network, uh, from, the, from the mining pool. Then they're going to be sending information back to the network and back to the mining pool. You, all, you need to have a basic understanding of how these different things work. Not that hard to learn, um, and you can ratio things up, but um, you do want to work with professionals to figure out how much cooling am I going to need. How much airflow am I going to need? An Antminer S9, I think it's 220 cubic feet per minute. If we run 100 of them, we probably need about 22,000 cubic feet per minute at a basic to come in and replace the hot air that we're generating. Maybe more, maybe less. Hot air expands. There's a lot of different factors that go into that. But that is a starting point. You can try that. Try it with 10. See if you can get 2,200 cubic feet per minute of air flowing through where your 10 amp miners are so that you bring in cool air to replace the hot air that they heat up. Uh, electricity. You got to bring in nice quality, reliable electricity. Um, you got to decide if you're going to have uninterruptible power supplies. I don't use uninterruptible power supplies. I figure my power is pretty reliable around here and if it goes down and it stays down for a couple days, that's okay. If I'm not mining, I'm not spending money on electricity, I'm not making money on mining, but it costs a lot to put in interruptible power supplies and it's not worth it because I like to keep costs low. Got to have a reliable network. I use 10 year old Cisco 48 port switches. I know how to configure them. I know how to set them up um, and, and that works for me. The information has to go out to a mining pool. Um, on top of this, you want to monitor your stuff to make sure it's running all the time and alert you if it isn't. You don't want to always have to be driving in or hanging out at the office and walking up and down the racks and seeing if there's red lights. You want to have some type of system. There's people that sell you monitoring systems out there. I use an open source one called Zavix that I've configured for my use um, to know what's going on. If half your miners drop off because a switch a breaker pops open, you're going to want to drive into the warehouse and take care of it. Um, but if everything's running smooth, you don't have to worry and check every hour um, and log into different things. You want to be alerted when there's a problem. Okay, so all this thing gives you bitcoins. I have the right bitcoin symbol here. 
um, or whatever altcoin there is, which then you have to have a way to convert it into dollars. Um, you can use something like Coinbase or, or Kraken or Kraken, or however they pronounce it. Once you start bringing in Bitcoin revenue on a regular basis, they're going to ask you what your business is. They might ask you to send a picture of your mine, a copy of your lease, uh, a copy of your business license. So from the get-go, if you're going to scale up a mining operation, my recommendation is to set it up as an actual business. If you set it up as an actual business, then once you start paying the bank and the bills, you can work with your accountants and you, the money that you put into these different machines, you can depreciate that and offset other income that you have or future income that you have. There's definitely tax advantages because hopefully you're making a profit and you're going to have to pay some taxes and then you can reduce, you can figure out how to reduce the uh, taxes that you have. So these are the, the major operational type things. Above and beyond that, there's different types of risks and there's risks in everything. That's one of the things that I, that whenever I talk to people about doing this, they say, oh, it's risky. Well, you know what? Everything is risky. And the way you go through life is you figure out what are the potential risks and what are the consequences of those risks? What's the worst case situation and how do I deal with that? If you can deal with the worst case situation of any risk that you can identify, then you can proceed and then you know what to do when that situation comes up. So let's talk about risks a little bit. So here's some of the risks that I think about running this type of operation. If I'm going to set up a, a company, an LLC, I'm going to sign a lease to rent a warehouse, so I'm going to put a bunch of money in to build out cooling and electricity, then I'm locked into a situation for a good three, four years. And I've got to figure out how to get in and out of that situation. Worst case, since I have not signed any personal guarantees for any of the spaces or anything like that, worst case, I lose money badly. The LLC has to go bankrupt, break the lease, sell off all the mining equipment and things like that. So worst case, in any type of business situation where I'm going to lose a lot of money, I think I'm going to at least come break it, come out break even, just because the equipment can get sold off um, or um, I can get out of longer term contracts or other things like that. So going out of business by completely running out of money, that's pretty much one of the worst case situations. I guess a different worst case situation is I can be doing something that's outlawed. Folks say, well, isn't Bitcoin just for folks that want to do things illegally? No, it's not. It's for folks that want to be able to have a form of electronic cash that's not controlled by the bank or governments especially since banks and gov governments are doing things like inflating the currency, outlawing large denomination bills, and looking at ways to completely track the economic activities of everybody. I don't like being told what to do. I'm happy to be providing an alternative to other folks like me that like to have basically a form of digital gold that has an established value that can be spent and saved and invested, a store of value that can also be used as a currency. So uh, if it's outlawed, okay, what do I do? Boom, in America, all Bitcoin mining is outlawed. Okay, great. Is it gonna be outlawed in every country in the world? Hmm, I bet I could ship up, pack up my Bitcoin miners, put them on a bunch of pallets, and go to a different country, maybe up to Canada, maybe to somewhere uh, in Latin America, maybe Iceland, I don't know, and then redo my entire operation there. I know how to do it. So it's, that's, uh, that's something that, that, I can, that I can do. Okay, now what if the Bitcoin price drops so much that I'm not able to make money? Well, that would be a problem. And that is a concern. That's one of the reasons that I'm diversifying into other altcoins in my mining and not keeping all my uh, profits in Bitcoin. But this is also one of these things that probably will take a little bit of time. It's probably not going to drop from, what is it, 900 now, down to 200 and just stay there. If that happens, a lot of the miners will stop mining because they have, uh, they're profitable at 900, but they're not profitable at 200. So as long as I can be one of the miners that has the lowest costs and the newest equipment, I know that even if the Bitcoin price drops, and I might not be making as much profit, and the payback on my equipment might take 
instead of a year, it might take two years or three years. But I also know that if I keep my cost low, I can outlast other miners there that have a higher cost. Okay, yeah, and with that, too many miners, adding too much uh, petahash to the system. So far, the amount of miners coming online and the price of Bitcoin has maintained a steady enough flow so that the miners make money. But again, this is why it's so important to be running a very efficient mining operation with equipment at the latest process technology and keeping your costs low as possible. If you can have some of the lowest costs in the mining industry, you're going to be okay when the price drops or too much petahash or exahash or whatever it's called these days comes online. Theft. What if I have, what if someone breaks in and steals all my stuff or destroys it or if I have a fire or something else? Well, I get insurance. I've got a local insurance agent. I've got uh, enough insurance to cover all our gear. Uh, we made sure that when we did the build out, we used licensed contractors. They followed uh, the code. They would, would that we registered with the county so we haven't done anything illegal that could cause the insurance company to deny our claims. We're on the up and up, a, a full up business and if I do have one of these problems, I have insurance. Um, equipment fails quickly. Well that would be a problem. If we bought a whole bunch of equipment and then three to six months it failed quickly. That's one of the reasons why I prototyped and proved the concept and ran in a smaller space. I'll do a, I'll do a, a video of my smaller space here. Um, so you can see what my proof of concept looks like. But it was running and it was reliable. I'm in the state of Georgia here, a little bit north of Atlanta. And it gets hot in the summer. It gets hot and humid in the summer. So I ran all my equipment using natural circulation airflow. Uh, I, didn't, I don't have a, a data center or air conditioning. And I ran it all through the summer. And it ran well. So this stuff is designed to run at high temperatures and to operate at high temperatures. So I'm confident in that in larger or larger systems will continue to run. Now, again, worst case, if things start to shut down because it gets too hot, can I figure out a way to add cooling? Yes, I can. I'd prefer not to because of that cost, but I can certainly add cooling to the system. And the equipment goes obsolete. Well, it helps. I've worked in a bunch of different industries. I've worked in the semiconductor industry for a while, so I understand process technology and how much it takes to invest in a new wafer fabrication facility um, with the new process technology. The equipment that I'm buying, um, the amp miners and the other types of equipment, is using the latest process technology, the 14 and 16 nanometer. We're going to go down to a smaller process technology, which is going to use less power at some point in the future. To me, that's still two to three years out from now, which is 2017. So I think I've addressed the majority of the risks. I'd love to find out what other risks you all think there are. Let me know in the comments and maybe I can address those on a future video. So to sum up, there's a lot of different things that a small miner has over, a, advantages that a small miner has over a large miner. Big thing is flexibility and running your own operations. You can also control your costs. So hopefully that helps give you some food for thought about uh, things that you want to think about. Um, oh, so I was gonna do skills. Okay, there's some basic technical skills that you probably want to have to succeed at Bitcoin mining. It'd be great if you knew how to build a PC. Uh, GPU miners that have six graphic cards in them. Uh, I've got instructions on my website how to put those together, all the parts you need, the complete bill of materials, um, how to put everything together, how to load the Linux operating system and get it up and running, and then how to do some basic troubleshooting. If you can go through and, and, and learn how to do that, that would be a good skill to have. It would give you uh, the ability to um, do a bunch of different things. Uh, follow instructions on, on how to use Linux. Well, all these uh, miners out there have a basic uh, have, have basic Linux built into them. Do you need to know how to secure a shell to them and access them? No, but it does help if you can understand how to uh, run a script, how to automate some things. I take it to a more advanced level by uh, using Zavix, which is a open source network monitoring system. So I'm able to monitor all my different equipment and have it send me emails when it falls below certain levels um, or goes offline or things like that. Um, 
but it would help to have a basic understanding of Linux. Um, network and security. You do want to have, run a secure system. Um, so you can take advice on uh, what type of firewalls to set up and what type of data networking, and, but you also don't want to set up network loops. Networking these days is a lot easier than it was 15, 20 years ago. <coughs> so uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that's, that's more plug and play. So it's not that hard to do. Um, airflow cooling electricity, you need to be able to talk to professionals um, and un have a basic understanding of amps and volts and power and cubic feet per minute and tons of cooling. Again, these are things that you can learn, you can watch videos um, and, and do, do stuff. And learn and use applications. So um, if you want to be storing your Bitcoin in a secure way, you got to learn how to use a hardware wallet and the applications that go with that. You got to be able to go online and access a mining pool. You have to be able to go into the graphical user interface of the different uh, mining machines and hook them up to a pool and monitor and make sure that things go well. Uh, you may want to do some A-B testing between different mining pools to figure out which one's paying you the most. Um, so there are different applications that you can learn. Is the skill set insurmountable to be able to run this type of stuff yourself? No, it's not. But I would recommend start small, learn a bunch of things when you're small, make mistakes when you're small, and then grow from there. Hopefully this video gives you some ideas and gives you some of the confidence that you need in order to start running your own mining operation. Because the more people that do this, that are run small mining operations, instead of just the large centralized mining operations, the more that we're going to be able to continue to grow and expand uh, the Bitcoin and altcoin economy to have it fully distributed amongst different locations around the world. So again, this is Rolf for Sluice I'm with Block Operations. Uh, come to our website, check out some of the tips and uh, other ideas that I've got here, and best of luck to you.